perfect. Let me uh, start over. <laughs> so my name is Ella, and I am uh, I am the head of learning at the Science Museum um, here at Aarhus University at the Faculty of Natural Sciences. Um, previously, I was here at the IMC, so I only started this position in December. So the seed actually began um, began be before I I I, I uh, moved over to this new position, and. Um, no, I can't. Okay, okay so this seed um, grew from a need to do collaborations with external partners, such as museums and libraries, because they're extremely uh, good if we want to create good learning environments, external and informal learning environments, together with children. And there were several projects here at the IMC where that was exactly what we wanted to do. Um, so the good thing about museums and libraries are that they're, they're authentic learning environments in the sense that children already go there. So this is actually some, a place, these are places where they already have learning, learning environment infrastructure and courses set up for visitors to come by. And they also know, the, the practitioners at the museums uh, know how to work with children and with their educators and their families because they do that already. The problem with doing uh, research in these informal lear learning environments where children are typically just there for a few hours and then like, they come there with their school or with their family voluntarily and then they, they stay there for a little while and then they go back is that it's extremely, uh, it's a quite substantial workload to set up da data handling agreements um, with the institutions. So for example, when we collaborate, we, we, in the previous project that I worked in here uh, at the IMC, we collaborated with a public school, and it took us almost six months just to set up the data handling agreement with the, with the municipality, which is extremely hard to do when you, when you, because then when you're in a museum, you don't know where the schools and the children come from, and if we collect data from them, how do we even handle that? So usually that's just not something that we can really do. So what we wanted to try to understand was whether we could tap into the, into the children's learning through different routes without collecting data directly from the children. Because if we don't, if we don't uh, do this, we miss out on important opportunities to collaborate with these partners to strengthen uh, learning environments for children. So basically we wanted to collect data from, um, from adults instead, um, from adult uh, educators and uh, facilitators, museum interpreters, um, by using this uh, technique called documentation, um, which is inspired by a practice that they use in uh, the northern mm -hmm. Italian town of Reggio Emilia, and they have been using it for quite a while. We use it, we call it Reggio Inspired because the, hi, yes. because what we do is uh, we, we use a, a, this definition by uh, Project Zero at Harvard Graduate School of, of Education, by Mary Krzyzewski and Ben Mordell, um, where they say that documentation is the practice of observing, recording, interpreting, and sharing the processes and products of learning through a variety of media in order to deepen and extend learning. So what you see right here is, is uh, me documenting adults um, trying to build a paper plane that lets them transport pennies. It's an activity that, that's called throwing away your money. Um, and what we were asked to document was any learning that happens about aerodynamics. So I, so I don't have any um, identifiable of the information about the people here, but I try to, I still, I tried to catch um, through photographs, you know, whatever they were working on with the balancing and the tip of the paper plane and what they did with the coins and how they tried to communicate uh, with each other what to do. Um, and after this picture they went out and they, and they tried it out and then they came back and they found out that they needed to do some improvements to try to make it work. So this is just an example of how, uh, how we think of documentation. But so what's important to say is that this is only basically the observing and recording part. What's also important is that we interpret and we share back with the learners what we observe and what they do, the strategies, in order to make them aware of the learning that happens. We've also used, um, in my previous 
previous project Collaborator, and we used them. Um, we did social learning together with autistic children, and we tried to to strengthen their learning by by supporting them and constructing little figurines that documented the social strategies that they use in the learning environment. Um, so, for example, this is a figurine that, that represents patience because the the kid uh, felt like he had to. He was this this guy on the on the train station waiting for the train to come, but the train racks were empty, and he felt like the train would never come, and he was waiting together with his two other uh, peers. So we tried to create this uh, story together with him and have this uh, this document this this figurine, and then have him share his interpretation of the situation with the other children in order to make them aware of the learning and the strategies that they were employing. So several of us, um, also Amos Blanton and Savannah Schutz, were really interested in finding out how can we use this pedagogical documentation that, they, that, they, that, they, that we know from Reggio Emilia and from Project Zero? How, what's the research potential in there? Can we collect data about children's learning from adult facilitators? So we applied, um, we, so actually the, the room, we, we have a room, we have an exhibition at the Steno Museum, which is at the other end of campus, um, where we built this large, uh, this is a large uh, pegboard. It's 21 meters all around. You'll see more photos later. And, um, and this room was funded by Collabular to, to try to invite uh, autistic children into the museum to share the, the results that we have from, the, from this project with them and their families uh, in the museum. But then we applied for a seat because we wanted to understand um, documentation. And we also wanted to develop a workshop format uh, for, for all schools, for all kids, about physics learning, learning about energy um, inside the, the room. And we applied for funding to do this, to try to see whether we could implement the documentation uh, practices in there. So we found six student interpreters. They, they study physics and biomedicine, um, and, we also, and, and they're facilitators at the museums already, so they're very uh, used to, to facilitating this type of workshop, um, well, similar types of workshops with children, with school children at the museums. And then we also found uh, three student researchers to do interviews with them. <coughs> and then we designed a course of two workshops and four interviews, so the workshops we all participated in and the interviews, we had the researchers interview the interpreters uh, from May to December to try to, to, to see what, how we could use uh, documentation. This is a um, photo from the, from, the, from the workshop. These are the student interpreters and uh, my colleague at the museum's comment. And these are, this is Liam Hyde, who is an external and Many of us know him here at the IMC. <laughs> he's a, he's a, a marble run expert among many other things. And Amos, uh, who is also here at the IMC, so some of you probably know him. And they, they facilitated, they helped to facilitate uh, the workshops where we trained the student interpreters in using the marble run and in doing documentation. And then we developed um, a course, uh, a workshop, two-hour workshop for schools. It's called Energy and Marble Runs. Um, and this is basically the background material, um, a PDF where we sort of combine everything in there. I'm not going to go through it. But, but the most important thing about it is that maybe you can tell from the different uh, colors here that it consists of different phases in the workshop. First, we have the kids just start building marble runs inside the room. Um, with very minimal introduction. We basically say to them, here are some pegs, here are some boards, can you guess what we expect you to do? And then they can, and they usually get it right, and we provide them with a challenge, usually something along the lines of build a run where the marble can run for 15 seconds, which is actually surprisingly hard, even though it doesn't sound that hard. But that, that's enough to get them to play. And then um, we have them explore for a 20 minutes and then we take them, we, we go around and observe the problems and the strategies that they choose and the problems that they run into. And then we, um, we take a break where we reflect with them. We take them outside the room because otherwise they won't stop. <laughs> and then we, uh, 
we set, we set up, we developed um, some demonstrations of some of the problems that they typically run into and that they, they struggle with in, in building these runs. And we have them um, help us demonstrate them and uh, come up with ideas for solutions together. And then we go back into the room and they implement the solutions that they develop together. Uh, and we also give them a second challenge. Um, for example, um, <coughs> integrate sounds into your run or make the make a trampoline for the mar marble inside the run or something like that. Um, and we have a list of all the challenges here that actually were also developed through the CollabLearn project, which is also part of this project. So it's a little bit confusing, but it's all integrated. <laughs> and then in the end, they share each other, they share with each other the runs. They tell about the runs and they show each other the runs. And I'm just gonna show you a few photos Oh, and it was quite successful. It was booked 33 times during the fall. Out of two, 22 were out of the 34, 22 were special education, and we had all the way from first grade to ninth grade um, in the room. And this is uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, and as you can tell, it's quite messy <laughs> and uh, chaotic. But uh, everybody is uh, is involved with their own process. So it's it's also. Um, in that way, it's actually quite easy to be in the room. And here you see one of the student facilitators having a conversation with the kid about this uh, rubber or elastic thing. Um, and you can also tell that the kids are quite engaged in having conversations with each other about how stuff works. And this is uh, from when they tell uh, and show. Um, in the end, they take a tour of all the runs together. And I really, uh, I really like the, the pride in her face. It's a, it's a lovely photo. So, what we found when working uh, through this process with the student interpreters is that, um, and these are just very preliminary results because we have all these interviews and we only finished them in December and it's been, um, yeah, so we still have uh, some, but these are the preliminary results. So, first of all, we found that documentation is very expensive. Uh, because it's so time consuming, it, I don't know, it, it should sit expensive right there. Uh, and it's also hard to implement. The way that, that we ended up implementing it in, uh, in this project was that we had this uh, framework, the, 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 the workshop outline that I just showed you in a, in a document that we gave, that we developed with the interpreters and changed along the way and gave to them. Um, and we also had some facilitation uh, questions and demonstrations to, to support that they had a practice that was, was reflective all the way through. And then we had the discussions, because they were always two uh, facilitating workshops, so we had, they were able to discuss, and then we had the interviews with the student researchers. So if you think back to the definition that I shared with you of, uh, of documentation, this was the way it was implemented, so we actually feel like we went through all the phases of documenting, um, observing, uh, recording, um, interpreting and sharing um, all the way through. But there, of course there are many forms of doing this and this was the form that we ended up using. And this is from one of the interviews. He says, at first it was great, but over time it was hard to keep up with the documentation during the workshops. It was hard to keep recording what it was that we got into the heads. Um, but what we can also tell is that the facilitators did notice individual children's learning in, in each their own ways. And they actually actively use these observations to support and deepen the learning that was going on. So I was really happy to see that, that they actually went, they were able to go and support the, the children, each individual learner in their learning processes. So this is another quote from an interview. It's right, so he's, so because what we also did was that we took some of the documentation that they collected and used them as prompts in the interviews to get them to talk about the learning. So they would sit there with a lot of PDFs with photographs and talk about them together. And one of them said about a photo that he's looking at, it's right in the learning moment. Here's a run, and the kid observes that it needs to take longer. How can we make it take longer? If we reduce the gap of the jump, and if the slope is less steep, that'll make everything more slow and easy. And there's definitely some kind of intuitive learning going on here. But whether it's something that they knew before they came, or if it just happened, but it's definitely a learning experience. So these are some of the reflections that the, that the student interpreters shared. 
So I think the oper operationalization of documentation that we used in this project is, is really good uh, because it, uh, it, for some things, it engages and includes um, all learners, children and adults as well. Um, we saw that, uh, that, and many of the, the facilitators also, or the student interpreters note in the interviews that they're surprised at how well it worked, with special education kids. Um, so it, it actually seemed to engage and include the learners when we facilitate them like this. It was also great as a professional development uh, um, workshop or, or, or course for the facilitators. Um, and it really was good for developing uh, these learner-centric museum formats because <coughs> when we developed the, 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 the workshop and the PDF, the outline for the workshop, we could we, we always knew why we were making specific changes because we had the documentation and we had the reflections from the facilitators and the interpreters, so we were able to go back and, and, and use that. Um, and I also think that working with learning um, in this way has some potential to establish extended learning environments together with educators. So when we had classes come in, the teachers and the educators would be very interested in knowing more. And the fact that we were documenting in the way that they were, that we were, made it possible to have an open discussion about the learning that was in the learning processes that were happening. But we don't really know what children learn in the setup. Um, and that's something that the, the facilitators, that, that what you also saw in the quote before, that's something that they also say, definitely, learning is going on, but what type of learning is going on? They note that uh, some of the learning, that some of the potential that we, that's in there is that the children learn about scientific method just from be iterating, going back, problem solving, and like this whole process that's, that's built into this type of learning. There are also quite a few limitations to what we did because it, it, of course it is, we think of it as a pilot. So how does this generalize? Um, so main problem is that we handpicked some of the most engaged uh, students to be student interpreters in this project. So they were really, really motivated to learn and to develop themselves and develop their, their strategies. So we don't know how this would generalize more widely in the, in the museums. And some of the student interpreters only facilitated four workshops in total, <laughs> which, you know, if you look at the ra ratio of four workshops to four interviews, that's just, that's not a good, you know, that's not great because you don't have that much material to really discuss. That also means that others facilitated 20 workshops, and they really have something to talk about. So that's something to think about. And then it was really hard to carve out enough time to create enough engagement over the eight months. So this sort of process really requires stability over time to secure continuity in the process. So the way that I'm going to, um, the way that I'm working with this right now is that uh, I think it's, like I mentioned before, it is a great technique for research and development, and I, I model some of the processes that I'm currently designing on this project and using the experiences from this project, because I think it's, it's great um, for professional development and for developing new learning formats and for developing new workshops uh, at the museums. Um, and I also think that it might work as a tool to understand children's learning through adults, but it's difficult in a one-stop workshop but perhaps if we have teachers or educators who have the children over time and, they, that, and if they know the children and if you're systematic and, 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 and think about the, how you record the learning and how you share the interpretation back with the children, I think we might be able to, 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 to use this in a research project, but I mean, it's, it's definitely not a, a shortcut. <laughs> it's just another cut. A way, another way of doing it. And I think it holds potential. And I just wanted to, to just uh, share with you who was in this project. Um, yeah, Amos, Savannah, and me, and then Liam, and then um, some of the interpreters from the Science Museum, some of the staff, and these are student researchers, and these are student interpreters. Yeah. So that's what I brought. Mm -hmm.